Good evening. How are y'all doing? I got a few props with me. But first, I want to I want to give a shout out to the uh, to the serve day. You guys should have got those serve day cards as you came in tonight. And I want to I want to recommend a couple options for you. If you're going, hey, you know what? I, I don't know about serve day. Well, it's next Saturday, and we're going to go out in force across our community. There will probably be close to 800, I don't know, six to 800 of us at East Coast. They're going to go into our community and go do some projects. And there's projects on that card. A, a few of those projects need a little bit of expl- explanation. Um, so I'm going to explain those to you before I get into the message. On the front side of your card, the bottom left says Brevard Rescue Mission. They're looking for people that could do maintenance type work. So if you're a handyman and you can do handy things, they need some handyman. That's down in Melbourne it's from 9 to 12. On the back of your card, Cocoa High School, come on, we get to go to Cocoa High School and do some painting. If you can paint, if you can roll paint, man, go to Cocoa High School, sign up for that one, say, you know what, I can help at Cocoa High School from 9 to 12. The public school system says, hey, church, come on, help me. That's good. That's good, right, church? Okay. Um, Overlook Missions, which missions, uh, that's the bottom second from the right on uh, the back of your card. They uh, are going to do what they do on the weekends and they feed folks on Saturday and they're looking for home cooked meals. And so if you can cook, come on. It says cook for four to six people. You could sign up for that. Those are three areas that need masses of people. And so if you could help with any of those, that's great. All of the things on this card are good, but if you're looking for one and you go, you know what, maybe I could help a little bit, those are three great ones. And we're gonna go out and change our community. That's a good thing, church, that we get to go out. I'm excited to be a part of a church that does that, that says, you know what, I'm not gonna sit still, but man, we're gonna go out and we're gonna reach our community. Man, 2,500 people came into our sanctuaries this week from, from our community to come and to have an incredible family time and to get some free backpacks and supplies. That is awesome. Thanks for doing it, church. You should applaud yourselves. You guys do great stuff. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to get into a message. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to give you some practical help tonight. Um, hopefully, my heart is that we don't, I don't want to just preach a message and then you walk away from here and do nothing with it. We're supposed to be doers of the word, and so hopefully, you're going to hear some things tonight that you can go, you know what, I can tangibly take that and I can walk away from here and do it. And, uh, and I, too, am excited about that series that's coming in a couple of weeks, but tonight, I get to share with you, and uh, I want to ask you a question about these things. This is a, obviously, you know what this is. This is a, I picked this up, actually, about 30 minutes ago um, across the street at the SPCA thrift store. Thank you very much. And you know what? I got an incredible deal because of this life-giving church that lasts right across the street. The lady said, you know what? I'm going to give you a deal. It says $3 for this thing, by the way. She said, I'm going to give it to you for a dollar because I go to your church. I was like, come on, I'll take it for a dollar. As a matter of fact, I'll give it back to you on Sunday afternoon. You can have it right back. But this is, a, this is obviously a screen. What's this? Help me, church. Air filter. And what about this? Anybody know what this is? This is, a, this is called a life straw. And a life straw is, a, is an, a glorified water filter. You could take this anywhere around the world. You could uh, unpop the caps of these, and you could drink out of the sewer if you had to. And this thing actually will clean the water. This is an incredible tool for missionaries all across the world or anyone that's living in areas where they don't get fresh, clean water. This thing right here is an incredible water filter called a life straw. And there are missionaries that literally live through these things. And uh, this will clean your water as you drink it. I want to talk to you about filters tonight. Can somebody say filters? I'm going to show you three scriptures and then we're going to pray. First verse is this, Proverbs 14, 12. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to destruction. Next verse is Hosea 4, 6. My people perish for lack of knowledge. And the third verse is this, Ecclesiastes 10, 10 from the NIV. It says, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Father, thanks. Thanks for your word. God, I thank you that your word changes us. It encourages us. It challenges us, and God, we get to conform to your image more and more because of your scripture and what we look at and what we learn. And Lord, I pray that as I share your word tonight, God, that it would come alive, that you would be Lord of this time and this place, God, that you would just be lifted up. We want your name to get all the credit for every good thing. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 I'm going to take you to 2014, way back, all the way back in the day to 2014, three years ago, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about my family. As many of you know, I am married. I have four children. Um, I have now, they're 13, they're 12, they are nine, and they are six, or seven. It's seven now, isn't it? Um, seven, seven, nine, 12, and 13. And uh, back in 2014, obviously three years ago, they were at different places in life. But um, in, that, in that one calendar year, we had two broken arms at the same time. Broken left arms, actually. My, my son fell out of a tree while we were out camping around the first of the year. And then uh, just maybe 10 days later, my other son fell off of a uh, fireman's pole um, at school, you know, the little playground pole that you slide down. He decided to maybe jump off or fall off, I'm not sure, but he went to reach like that. 
dislocated elbow. Um, the other one had radial and humerus break fractures. And then about maybe two weeks later, um, my daughter um, playing on the playground uh, ran face first into a kid. They were playing tag and he busted his front two teeth. That was the other kid. Meanwhile, my daughter busted her forehead wide open and, you know, emergency room via ambulance from school. Somebody say stressful. Anybody? <laughs> stressful. Suddenly you have three children that need like bathing, uh, full-time bathing. They need help. They have arm breaks. They have stuff going on. Meanwhile, my wife had been training for a half marathon. Um, first time she'd ever run that far. She was training with Jessica Stahlbaum, actually one of Pastor Matt's wife. Uh, they were training and she had just successfully completed a half marathon and suddenly was like bedridden, was just literally had a hard time getting out of bed fatigue. And all at once, can you say stressful yet? Life is pretty hectic. Meanwhile, I'm training for triathlons because that's what I do. I train, you know, I was getting up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd go run, you know, six, eight miles, maybe ride two hours in the morning, come home. And uh, by about eight o'clock in the evening, I was ready to shut it down. And I know none of you guys have lives like this. You aren't this crazy to even take on all that stuff. But in about 10 days, y'all are going to have some kids go back to school. Anybody got kids going back to school? Can you believe summer's almost done? Some of y'all are like, yes, yeah, school's starting. And other of y'all are going, the fall is coming, and that means commitment after commitment after commitment is coming. And what in the world am I going to do with my life and my schedule? Because life is crazy and hectic and stressful. And I want to talk to you about some, just some natural, practical things of how to say yes and how to say no. And what are these things to do so you don't end up like me back in 2014, just literally stressed, going, what in the world are we doing to ourselves? Why are we doing this? Because God's got a better plan than that craziness. Amen? And maybe the enemy was involved in some of that, you think? You think the enemy was, you know, at, at all involved? I, I, I do believe that. You know, there's answers for this stuff, and it's in Philippians chapter 4. And uh, in verse 7, it says this. It says, if you do these things, Philippians 4, 7, do we have that upstairs? Somebody help me. It says, if you do these things, anybody got a Bible tonight? I got Bibles. Come on, Bibles. We'll read about the Bible. That's good stuff. I actually have it in my notes, but I like to turn to my Bible or show it to you. I'm giving them time, too. This is delayed. This is stalling. Preacher stalling. And then it puts me on the spot like I've got to find it in my Bible fast. Here's what Philippians 4, 6 actually says. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And then verse 7 says, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know what? It starts with prayer. If we're going to get things right and order in our lives, we need to talk to Jesus about it, right? That we have access to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, that at this point, the peace of God would come. Well, that starts with a life of prayer. And so I want to encourage you, if, you're not, if your prayer life and every one of us could say our prayer life could be better, if your prayer life is be the best that it's ever been, it could probably be a little bit better. The scripture says that you could pray without ceasing. And unless you're doing that, you probably could get better. Amen, church? But this is not to beat you up and go, hey, we're not praying enough. This is to go, hey, let's start there. We need to start in prayer. But I'm going to give you some practical things on top of that. So when God gives you a little inkling to go, hey, what about that? Or what about that? in your prayer life that you could then know how to make some decisions about what to do and what not to do. Anybody know that you can't do everything? You've probably experienced, you've tried to do about everything and it just doesn't always work out like that. I wanna look back at Ecclesiastes 10.10. It says, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. You know where strength comes? Church, the scripture says you can be built up in your most holy faith if you'll pray in the spirit. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, that'd be a great start. You can get built up in your faith. I don't know about you, but if you need an injection, man, pray in the spirit. That's a great place to pray and to go for it. But then it says this, but skill will bring success. There is a skill portion of this, rightly dividing, how am I gonna do life? How am I gonna do life? You know, I believe we need filters in our life. We need things that help us screen. Come on, somebody say screen. We need to screen some things. We need some things that we just hold up and go, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Well, I'm gonna give you four questions to ask yourself. Um, tonight, we're going to start with this one. Anybody want to learn tonight in church? Yeah. Let's learn. Before I do that, I got to actually read another verse, Philippians 3.12. Paul said this one thing. It says, not that I've already attained all this. I haven't attained either. I, if anyone stands here tonight and says they've, they've figured it out, um, I'm still working this stuff out. But Paul said, not that I have already attained all this or have already been perfected, but I press on to take hold for of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to lay hold of, but one thing I do, and check this out, one thing I do, it says, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on, I press on towards the goal 
to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. You know, God's got a call on every one of our lives. God's got a thing, one thing. And that one thing might, be, might mean that you do a lot of things. But that one thing that's important that God's designed you to do, let's be good at that one thing. You know, Pastor Dan stands up, I think he actually shared last week, and he said there's, there's not a lot of things that he does well. He says, but what he does well, he wants to be very good at. And I think if we would all work into our lives to go, you know what, I can't do everything well, but I can do some things well. And that means I can't say yes to everything. I need to say no to some things. And when I say yes to something, you know what? I'm actually saying no to some other things. And when I say no to something in my life, you know what I'm actually saying? I'm saying yes to some things in my life. And those yeses and those nos, I think we can rightly sort those things out. It's been said before, but I'll reiterate this. The enemy of great is good. You could be good at a lot and never be great at anything. And I think God's design for you and for me is that we would be great at some things. That we'd be great, that we would be a church that was great. That you'd be a person that, when you, you could read testimonies like that about your life, where you jump two levels in your workplace. That you don't, you know, you get, you get promotion and you're like, you can't figure it out. But God did it because you were excellent at something. Let's be excellent at something. I think it starts with asking some questions though. We have to select some things in life. We have to say, you know what? This matters more than that. You know what, I had to get to a place in 2014 where some things mattered more than my triathlon or that my race, and honestly, I was pretty good at it, and I would say, you know what, I might even have been great at it, but you know what, that's me talking about me, and that stuff's gonna dry up when it's all said and done. Those trophies go nowhere except to the Goodwill, to the SPCA. Go check it out, there's plenty of them over there, right? Those trophies don't matter. You know what matters, you know what's gonna last? We're gonna get to that, it's one of my questions. Here's the first question. Who's gonna be your authority? If you gotta make decisions, who's gonna be the authority that you base your decisions on? It could be you, it could be me. And you say, you know what, my gut's pretty good. You know what, my gut is not good. My gut lies to me, my heart lies to me. There's actually a verse in, in Jeremiah 17. It says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick, who can understand it? So I wanna say, if you're gonna use you as your gut and you go, you know what, I, I, could, I could sort this out, as your judge, you know what? That's dangerous. Now my redeemed heart, my redeemed mind by the Spirit of God, you know what, I can sort some things out by the grace of God. But you know what? I gotta be careful. There was a time, and I don't have this in my notes, there was a time where my wife and I were first married and I decided one Sunday afternoon, I just wanna play basketball. I was gonna go out and play basketball. Somebody from the church here invited me to go play in this church basketball league over at Woody Simpson Park, actually here on Merritt Island behind Target back there. And uh, it was, it was pretty cool. Like, I thought, man, basketball would be pretty fun. My wife, though, got sexy voice. You know that, right? Husbands, you have a sexy voice of God. It's your wife. She's supposed to help you, your helpmate, right? Husbands, she might, she might know what she's talking about. Wives, you, sometimes your husband is there, you know, to speak the word of God to you. But my wife said, you know what? I don't know. I'm worn out. I'm tired. I don't know all these things. And I was like, I need some time for me. Husbands, you ever said that before? I just got to go play golf. Come on, just maybe it's golf for you. For me, it was like, hey, I'm going to go do this, or I need some time in the garage, or I need some time this or that, and I went for it. It was miserable. Y'all know, you've done these things before. You know you do something, you step out, you go do something for you, and you're like, man, that was dumb. It wasn't even fun. You know what? I need to use some things. I need to say, who's my authority? My authority cannot be me. My authority needs to be something better than that. My, my heart deceives me. You know, you've, you've done some dumb things because you thought it was right. If I leave me to myself, I'll end up somewhere I don't want to be, fast. I'm not reliable. Somebody say, I'm not reliable. That's a hard confession. For those of you that are great confession folks, that's a tough one to make. But you know what? I know what is reliable, and it's this. The Word of God is reliable, and I can stand on that. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to destruction. There's plenty of things that I thought were right that, I, that just seem right. But you know what? They just lead down somewhere that I don't want to be. That's how I was before Christ. I decided everything for me. But then I came to Christ and I surrendered. And I said, you know, it's not about me anymore. But I end up back there sometimes. Paul said it in, in, uh, in the New Testament. Paul said, you know what? There's things I do I don't want to do. The things I don't want to do, I do. We've all been there. You end up doing things based on what you want to do. You know what? That's not the best thing. That's not the one thing. That's not pressing on to the high call to God's best for your life is you deciding that. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You've got to put your heart over there and you've got to go, I've got to trust God with my heart so that my heart actually is redeemed, so that my heart makes good decisions. I need some people to help me make good decisions. It can't be me. 
The other people, the other, the other thing, you go, hey, you know what? It's not me that makes the best decisions. Maybe it's some other people who are making decisions for you. Maybe you looked around a little bit and you get in the comparison trap. You start looking at other things that people have. And there's, a, you know, there's things that, that lie to us. First John 2, 15 and 16. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, come not from the Father, but from the world. You know what? We get caught up. I've got caught up. We, we all get caught up in something that looks good. You look over there and it looks good. The appearance of it, right? That's the lust of the eyes. You're looking around and you're seeing it. You know what? That's a lie. It's not God's best. It's not God's best. It could be clothing. It could be stuff. It could be surgeries. It could be a lot of things. We do some dumb things that seem good. Like, who decided to put cucumbers on eyes and that was good for you? Or mud baths. My, we were at the beach yesterday. My daughter was like putting mud all over her. And I was like, somebody decided that was good for them somehow. I'm not anti-mud baths or cucumbers. But who thinks this stuff up? It looks good, man. I'm going to look better if I do that stuff. You know what? Maybe. I know what Psalm 139 says. It says that I've been perfectly made. I've been formed in my mother's womb. He knew me. And from the foundation of the earth, he knew me. Wonderfully made, it says. I don't have to do a bunch of stuff to try to get to look a certain way. I don't have to drive a certain car to get some status. I'm not valued based on my net worth. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Now, is your net worth valuable? Sure it is. But I can't find my, who I am and what I look like. You know what? Maybe feeling good. Isn't it crazy that sex sells everything from soap to like spark plugs to paper towels to what else? Everything. Donuts. Donuts. They'll sell you anything through something that feels good. You'll feel like this if you just use these spark plugs. Come on crazy. You know what the largest industry in the world is today? Entertainment. It looks good. There's a lot out there that looks good, feels good. How about having some stuff? How about materialism? You know what? If we're going to decide what we do based on what I'm going to acquire, what I'm going to have, you know what? There's never going to be enough. There'll never be enough. You, they will leave you wanting more and more and more. There's a reason why lotto, lottery winners go bankrupt. There's a reason why some of the greatest entertainers and the greatest wealthiest of whatever end up with nothing because it just the stuff is never going to add up. Your worth can't be tied to your net worth. You know what? The third option for how you decide and how we get to the answer, number one question, is this, God's word. How about God's word? How about who's going to be my authority? How about the word of God is my authority? How about I decide, you know what? He's trustworthy. Is God trustworthy, church? Yes, he is. If, if scripture is true, which I believe it is, and I think that if you taste and see, you'll, you'll find out that he's good all the time. But if scripture is true and it says that it's the word of God that upholds the universe, don't you think he's trustworthy? It's, it's a point where we could say, you know what, if I'm going to decide how and what I'm going to use as a filter in my life, I got to base it on something concrete. It can't be ishy, you know, wishy-washy, you know, one thing today and another thing tomorrow. Though culture may shift, the word of God's not shifting. It's standing still and it's firmly planted. Amen? We could be firmly planted. You know what? His voice has to be number one. If his voice isn't number one, if he's not the thing that we want to hear and we need more than we need anything else, we need to grow to a place where we are hungry for his, his word. We got to hear his word. His word will speak to you. If you've never heard his voice through his word, you know what? Let somebody help you sort this out. God wants to speak to you. He wants to do life with you. That is awesome. We get to do life with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. That is awesome. John 8, 31 and 32. It says, to the Jew who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You can rightly divide What's going to work in your life? Number two question is this you got to ask. What's going to last the longest? If I do this, what's it going to look like 10 minutes from now, maybe 10 years from now? What is it going to look like? What matters most? You know what we rarely evaluate? What I didn't tell you about 2014 was I went and did this triathlon. It was the longest triathlon I ever trained for. It was like a four-hour race, which was dumb. I don't know what I was thinking. But someday I'll, someday I'll have more time and I'll do more fun things like that craziness, right? I like it though. I like pushing my body. I like, I like the, what that does to me to have to mentally go, I'm going to make this and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. But you know what? That, that, that year, it was October. It was like the middle of October. I did this race with a few other guys from the church here and it was super sweet. It was fun. But I was actually preaching that weekend. So I raced this four hour race on, on Saturday morning 
and I had to rush out of there after the race to get back here to preach on a Saturday night. That was dumb. Sunday morning, I had to preach three more times, and I was pretty sore from a four-hour race, right? But I get a phone call in the, between 10 o'clock and the 11.30 service from my dad, and he said, your grandfather passed away. And I just went, dude. And I walked across the way over here. Pastor Dave Ellis was sitting on the front row at the time. Pastor Dan was out of town. I walked across, and I said, Pastor Dave, I don't know what's about to happen here, but I just found out that my grandfather passed away. I might be emotional. I might get up there and be a train wreck. But you know what? I'm going to plow ahead. And it was at that point that I said, you know what? Something's got to change. I can't keep grinding away. Y'all, any grinders in the house? Come on. Some of us just, do we just go? Come on, we're going to get there. We're going to do it. You know what? There's better than grinding away. There's better than that. God's got better than that. What's going to last? You know what? We don't change when we see the light. You know when we change? When we feel the heat. When stuff starts getting hot and hard and you're like, man, maybe then I'll change. There's a better way to change. There's a better way to change before you have to. Why not change because the love of God is more than enough and God's got a good plan for your future? How about doing it out of the love of God instead of doing it out of because I have to? Maybe you get fired, maybe you get divorced, maybe somebody dies, some health crisis, something like that, and then we decide. 1 John 2, 7 says, the world and its desires will pass away, but those who do the will of God will live forever. You know temptation? It's always a dilemma between now or later. Now or later. Am I going to walk away from sin or walk away from that thing because my future's better if I don't? Because I love God enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to go that direction. I'm going to go this direction. What's going to last longest? You know what? We're a microwave. We want it right now generation, right? We want it now. You know what? Faith comes and it doesn't always happen right now. It might happen in the spirit right now, but we don't always see it, right? You know what? We need to be willing to have delayed gratification. It's okay. But the answer's not right there. We're going to keep on plowing because he's faithful. We're going to do it his way. Because you know what? His way will endure. What's going to last? Number three. Will I choose, you? Will I choose what's easy or what's best? Anybody like their snooze button? Come on, that's easy. I'm not good with the snooze button. Honestly, if I hit the snooze, it's over. Like I'm, I'm not moving for like not just the seven or the nine minutes. I'm going to be there for a while. I've decided snooze ain't happening for me. I just got to go. Snooze is okay. If you want to build in an extra nine minutes, you know, have a little margin, go for it. But that didn't work for me. My personality is like, I'm either awake or I'm asleep, right? But it's easy. It's easy. Here's the question. Am I going to live what I value, right? Can my filter be actually a value system? Can I actually hold up a screen in front of my life and go, you know what? My values matter more than what's easy, yeah. What's easy will get us in trouble. You know what? Uh, George Gallup, the Gallup polls, you guys know about the Gallup surveys? He said this. He said that the number one cause of stress in America is incongruent values. That your lifestyle doesn't match up with what you believe. That's what causes the most stress in America. Is that you say you believe something and you hate that you're doing something different than that. And it's just conflict all the time. Conflict with value versus what you're actually doing. You know what? There's a way to walk out your value system by the Spirit of God to actually be and to say and to just, just live out the high call of Christ Jesus. You can do this. You know what? Any Starbucks fans? Come on, I'm not anti-Starbucks. Anybody like some coffee? How about, forget Starbucks for a second. You might not like Starbucks, but how about coffee? Any coffee drinkers? Okay, thanks. That was better. I, I didn't know Starbucks was like so like bad. No one liked Starbucks. But y'all like coffee, right? You know what coffee... I'm a coffee drinker too. I, like, I had coffee with a couple of my buddies this morning. It was cool. We sat on the porch and drank coffee. That was cool. That's what we do now. But coffee is good. I like coffee. But you know what coffee can be for people? It could be an easy little, little, little pick-me-up, right? Man, I need my afternoon. I need my morning. I need my before long. You need, 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 right? You know what? I don't know if that's God's best all the time. Come on, check in your coffee drinking. Sorry. But you know what? We can default to easy. We got to be careful, right? We got to be careful. You know, NASA did this study. It says this, and this is legit. This isn't me making stuff up that NASA did. This is good. NASA's study found that a 40-minute nap increases alertness by 100%. I don't know how that works, but I'll take naps. I like some naps. Anybody like some naps? I just gave you nap time. Instead of coffee time, you get nap time. Come on. But it says this. Another study found that a 20-minute nap is more effective than 200 milligrams of caffeine or a bout of exercise. Just take a nap. Don't exercise anymore. Just take naps. It says, yet another study 
showed that pilots who were allowed to take a 25-minute nap while the co-pilot manned the controls nodded off five times less than their nap-deprived peers. I don't know about you, but an airplane where a pilots are nodding off, no thank you. <laughs> nap. How about that? How about actually taking time and saying, you know what, instead of just grind, 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 you have to actually stop and rest. Somebody say rest. rest. I'm not good at it. I'm not, but I'm learning to get better at rest. Rest is healthy. Rest is good. But you know, I like vacation, but when I'm not on vacation, boy, I like to just go. And you know what? Rest is okay. It's okay. But it's not so macho to say, you know what? I just rested. Come on. It's hard, right? People want to know that you're doing something. It's actually more cool to like be working 24 seven going for it. I got three jobs and I got this and I got this and I got this. And you know what? You know what? It might just be that God's got a better plan than that. It might just be. My fourth question is this. Is it worth the price? Is it worth the price that you're paying to do whatever that thing is? You know, there's a story in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 25. And y'all know, because you're church people, you understand the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You understand Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's generational there, and that Abraham was the father of the faith, and his son, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and then his son, Jacob. And that's kind of the lineage of our faith. And, you know, but you know, it wasn't actually set up to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It actually was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. Look at this. This is in Genesis 25. I'm going to jump in at verse, let me see, 27. Can you pop to 27? Genesis 25, 27. It says, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. Any outdoorsman? Nobody. Nobody here. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his name, Edom, which means red. Um, that's what my Bible at least said. It says, all right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? Dude was going to give up his inheritance for a bowl of stew. I think I got a picture of a bowl of stew. This is probably not what it looked like, but this is some stew I ate one time. Come on. Your birthright for this? My wife makes some good stew. How about it? I didn't realize that that was going to be a shot at my wife in the process. Thank you for my wife. God, thank you, Jesus. This is going to be awesome. Anyway, your birthright for some stew? You know what we do? We don't give up our birthright, but you know what we give up? We give up our marriage, we give up our families, we give up our jobs, we give up our, our, our future finances because we're paying interest on credit cards. Come on. We, we give up a whole lot for stuff that looks like stew sometimes, stuff that doesn't end up anything valuable. Look it. So Jacob said, first you must swear me your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. And here's what the last line says. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. What are you willing to pay? That ought to be a question that you ask. You go, hey, am I going to do this or not do this? You got to ask the question, is it worth what I'm about to pay for it? I know, this is some preaching, huh? Your toe's getting, is it getting a little bit touchy? Come on, church. We need it. We need this. So if, if I'm going to ask all these questions, then what's my value system going to actually add up to be? I think there's some things that absolutely matter and that you need to put at the top of the list. If you're going to build a value system, I'd challenge you, husbands, wives, families, sit down together and go, you know what? These things are valuable to us. Let's maybe, this is the year, 2017 is the year of transition that leads to transformation. Maybe you would transition some things in your lives and you go, we need to place some more value on some things. We've got to move some things up the ladder a little bit. And maybe you'd ask that question. That's what we had to do. My wife and I in 2014, we had to sit down and go, hold on a minute, this is not working. We've got to do some things different. And so we began to do some things, some other things we'd already been doing. And I'll share some of those before I'm done tonight. But what's important? You know what? Jesus has got to be important. What you do with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords has got to be right up there at the top. You heard earlier in our service that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. That's got to be number one got to be number one. If it's not yet, man, make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let him sit first place. It's better with Jesus. Church, is it better with Jesus? Anybody? Yeah. It is. It is. After that, my family matters. My family is what's going to last. 
And if my family doesn't last, then my ministry doesn't last. If, if my family is miserable, you know who else is miserable? I am. Y'all have walked through stuff. You know when your family's not right, when your family's struggling, when your relationships are beat up. You know what? How hard it is to do life. We got to put Jesus, and then we got to get Jesus into our families, and we got to put family there. So for me, one of the practical things that I do with my family is my wife and I have a date every week. We decide, we calendar it in, it's like there, it happens. It hasn't always been this way, but we've said, you know what? Kids are all in school. Man, we're excited about school. On Friday's my day off, my wife and I go on a date every week. It, there's nothing that's going to get in the way of that. Even if there's like a, hey, there's this field trip over here. You know what? We're going to go early and we're going to have breakfast. We're going to do something. We're going to do time together. My kids, this is something that I learned from a, um, a website. There's actually resources on your insert, your sermon insert. It's called All Pro Dads. All Pro Dads is a ministry to dads. They help you. They give you an email every day. If you want it, you can sign up for it. This thing helped me. They said, do this every day. Take a minute a day with your kids. Take an hour a month with your kids and take a day a year with your kids. And what I've tried to do is I've tried to take my, every one of my kids on a daddy date every month. You go, dude, how do you afford that? You know what? I take them to the donut shop. That's where it started. The donut shop, man, for three bucks, you can have a great time. They sit on the twisty chairs and they love it. It's cool. But you know what? We've advanced that. Now I got a 13-year-old over here. And I say, you know, where do you want to go? If it costs me 20 bucks, it's the best 20 bucks I invest every, every month behind Jesus. I give to Jesus and then, you know what? My family matters. I'm going to... She wants to go wherever she wants to go. Hey, we're going to go to breakfast somewhere. You pick it where we're going to go. And if it's $22 or $25, you know what? It might mean I've got to make other decisions. I say yes to that. You know what I might say no to? Maybe I don't have cable television. It's okay. It's all right. You know what I choose to do? I choose to do what's valuable. I choose to put a filter up and go, you know what? Jesus matters. My family matters. And church, I don't even have it all right. I'm still struggling. I'm still working on stuff. But you know what? My wife matters. My kids matter. Behind that, what else matters? The church. I, I believe this. I believe that if I build his house, he's going to build my house. That's true. My life is better because of a place called East Coast Christian Center. Not just because I work here. This church changed my life before I ever worked here. This church has just radically changed my future going forward. Generations are going to be different because of what a church called East Coast, and other church before that that I got saved in, is going to radically just propel my family forward. You know what? I have great friends because of a church. You're lonely, you're, you're going, man, I just need something. You know what? Small groups are incredible. Freedom group, if you haven't signed up for freedom group, a freedom group would be awesome. That is a way you can get connection in your local church. Man, church matters to me. It matters that my kids want to serve the local church. So they don't just come to church and go, man, church. They want to serve. My daughter wants to play in a band and my son wants to do lighting stuff back here and you know, move faders around and stuff. I'm like, go for it, buddy. Go for it. Have fun. You know what? It's healthy that you're part of a church. That matters. Is there balance? Yes, there's balance. I could burn up my family doing church. That's not God's best. It's not God's best. But my, my family loving church is, is valuable to me. What else is valuable? My future is valuable. I believe that the generations that come matter. And so you know what? I do save. Financially, I think you should give first. Save second. Spend third. We save. Financially, we have margin. We have a value system that says, you know what? I'm going to give first. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give to missionaries. I'm going to give to food pantries. I'm going to give to stuff. And then you know what we're going to save because my future does matter. I want to send my kids to college and I want to see them blessed. Amen. I want to see their, my children's children blessed. That's godly. That's biblical. That's the word of God. You know what? Give, save, spend. It matters. But you know what? If you don't have that value, you can grow in it. That's good news. You can grow. I didn't start there. I just started somewhere. And you know what? Here we go. Your yes doesn't have to be the same as my yes. My yes is not the same as your yes. When I decide what I do and don't do, I have value system. I have filter. Come on, filter. 12 by 12 air conditional filter. I have a filter that strains what I say no to. There are things that I say no to that are sin. There's other things that are very good that I have to say no to because these other things are more valuable. When I say yes to something, it's I'm saying no to something else because I can't do it all. I don't think you guys can either. Look what Philippians 4.13 says. If you hear nothing else tonight, we'll take this home with you. Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things. How are you going to do all things? Through him. Any good thing that's in my life, you know how it's good in my life? Through him who strengthens me. If, it, if it's good that I take my kids on a daddy date, if it's good that I take my wife on a date, if it's good that I store up for generations to come, if it's good that I give, it's good that I do all these things, you know what? It's only because it's through him. It doesn't happen any other way but through him. Your value system, it's only going to work if it's motivated by love. I love Jesus. I love my family, my wife, my kids. I love the church. 
And you know what? I love people. I'm involved in our community. Why? Because I love people and I know what the church has done for me, what the gospel has done for me. And so I reach out to a community. I get involved in a little league and I get involved in triathlon worlds and I go run with a group of guys and I still lift and I don't just shut all that down and say no to everything. I don't do that. You know what I do? I'm looking going, hey, God, what do you want to do in this? Is this going to be lasting or is this just for me and building my kingdom? I don't want to build my kingdom. Anybody want to build their kingdom? You know what? That's going to dry up fast. It's going to burn up. It's not worth it. You know, Pastor Dan said this in the creative team when we were preparing for this message. I'm almost done. He said, you know what? I was completely irresponsible. He said, Pastor Dan said this, I may have been one of the most undisciplined people until I gave my life to Christ. Surrendering his heart to Christ made him disciplined. How did that work? Because when he does stuff, he does it through him now. You become new. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that all things become new. Your discipline, your decision making, your filter on how you do life, it can change when you come to Christ. You say, well, I've been walking with Christ for a long time. You know what? Then we go back to what we started with in Philippians 4, 6. We need to pray. And we got to hear from God. And you know what? When you say yes to God, there's power there. The grace is there to accomplish that thing you're saying to yes. You're yes to God in. I don't know what area you might need to say yes. But I do know this. There's a group of people going down the road together. This place called East Coast Christian Center. that are trying to say yes to God. And you could get around some people that could help you. That would be awesome. Small groups, serve days, connect class. There's a lot of ways you can connect up and grab arms with some people and go down the road together. I realize that sometimes I've connected up with the wrong people and I've ended up somewhere I didn't want to be. Anybody ever done that before? Come on. Let's hook up with the right people. I wrote this down. I think I heard it somewhere. But you can't soar with eagles if you're going to run with turkeys. You can't run around with turkeys and fly. You can't. If you're going to soar like an eagle, you're going to have to get around some other eagles. You're going to have to get around some people that say, you know what, you can do this. You can do all things through him. Come on, you can do this. What do you mean you can't give, you can't this, you can't, I can't serve, man, I got no time. You know what? Have you asked God? Have you gone to the Lord? Have you prayed and said, God, what do you want me to do with that? I can't, I can't support an orphan. I can't give towards a church plant. I can't give, to, you know what? Have you asked God? And if he says to do it, you know what? The grace of God is there. The power is there to do what you can't do yourself. That's what the grace of God is. You can do it. It's an empowerment to do what you can't do yourself. You can do this. Maybe you'd say yes in this season. I just want to challenge you. You're going to the fall. The fall is going to happen. It's coming. You know what? Christmas is coming. Can you believe it? Dude, I know you didn't want to know that. But Christmas is coming. And it's going to get hectic. What are you going to do? Maybe you'd say yes to some family time. Maybe you'd change a hobby. Maybe you'd eliminate the snooze button. I don't know. Maybe you'd serve somewhere that you're gifted. Let's do this. I'm going to, last, I'm going to end with this scripture. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. It says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. You can get caught up doing some stuff that you didn't need to be doing, or you can say, you know what? I want to make the most of my time. Can we pray, church? Let's pray. Father, thanks. Thanks for wisdom from heaven. God, you say you pour it out liberally. You give it to us more than we can ask, think, or imagine. Lord, I thank you for speaking to your people tonight. There was a little prick, a little poke in their heart, maybe, to just say yes to that one thing. And maybe say no to a bunch of things. God, I thank you that you empower them to make that decision and to do it rightly. And God, that you get all the credit. You get all the glory. In Jesus' name. If you're here, amen. You can look up here. Pastor Kevin, come on. Come on, Pastor Kevin. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, make that decision. That's the best yes you could ever make. Amen? I'm done.